some questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Minister for Finance promised a balanced budget by 2027. She said that deficits are having an effect on inflation. But her budget adds 60 billion extra dollars on the inflationary fire, $4,200 per family. Will the minister finally recognize that Canadians can no longer pay? And will she table a plan to balance the budget to reduce inflation and interest rates? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Conservatives show that they are completely irresponsible and that for them, the only important thing is trying to pick partisan fights here in Parliament. Today, the Conservatives are trying to suppress the help that Canadians need and that we would like to give Canadians. For example, in this budget, we will improve the Canada Workers' Benefit. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition what is irresponsible are policies that increase inflation and inf interest rates. Canadian consumers are the most indebted in the G7. Consumers are the most indebted, more so than even the Canadian economy. The, the minister admits causing inflation because of inflationist policy. This will increase interest rates even higher on the backs of these indebted consumers. Will she finally implement a balanced budget to reduce inflation and interest rates before there is a crisis? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what is truly shocking is the completely irresponsible position, an adolescent position taken by the Conservatives. They prefer partisan bickering than helping Canadians. And I would like to explain to you what there is in the budget and what Canadians need. For example, better worker benefits, doubling, for doubling for, defi for deductions for tools. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It's just six months ago that this minister promised a balanced budget by the year 2027. She said that uh, inf deficits fuel inflation. A deficit Finance Minister John Manley, a Liberal, said that while the Bank of Canada is slamming on the brakes of inflation with higher rates, this government is slamming on the gas with higher spending. This could cause the whole engine to blow when all of that mortgage debt Canadians hold comes up to renewal unless the rates come down. So will she act now to put in place a plan to balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates? Here, here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, I am truly appalled by the reckless and irresponsible behaviour we are seeing from the Conservatives today. They are showing that they prefer adolescent partisan games over actually delivering support to Canadians. So let's talk about what they are preventing Canadians from getting with their parliamentary childishness. They are preventing Canadians from getting the doubling of the tradesperson's tool deduction. They are preventing us from putting in place an anti-flipping tax wow. that's going to stop speculation in homes. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what is truly reckless is driving up inflation and interest rates on Canadian consumers who are the most indebted in the entire G7. In fact, the combined consumer debt is almost bigger than the entire Canadian economy. And when the monster mortgages that Canadians took out with the advice of this government back in 2021 and 22 come into higher rates for renewal, there could be a massive mortgage meltdown. 
Therefore, will the, pri will the finance minister do what she promised only six months ago, and that is to say, stop putting fuel on the inflationary fire, balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates? Yes or no? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, someone who advised Canadians to opt out of inflation by investing in crypto is pretty ill positioned to offer economic advice of any kind. And you know what he is doing instead of providing a responsible economic plan? He is blocking the support that Canadians need real measures in our budget implementation bill. For example, cracking down on predatory lending. Who could be opposed to that? Isn't that what Canadians need right now? But the Conservatives, with their frivolous, childish behaviour, are stopping Canadians from getting this. Bravo. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Quebec families are being struck by forest fires. This includes fires also elsewhere in Canada. The Conservatives are here to support any government measures that will be necessary to protect Canadians and to minimize the effects of forest fires. I would like to thank the Minister for the briefing that he gave, and I would like to offer him the opportunity to give an update to this House and all Canadians on the state of the forest fires and what the government is doing to respond. Minister of Emergency Preparedness. I thank the member opposite uh, for, for the important question and also for the strong advocacy from every member of this House on behalf of their communities. Um, Mr. Speaker, there are currently 370 wildfires burning in Canada, 217 of which are out of control. There have been over 26,000 evacuations from communities right across the country um, in response to a request for assistance from the provinces of Alberta, Quebec and Nova Scotia. We have de deployed the Canadian Armed Forces into those three provinces. In each location, the Canadian Armed Forces are now in the field assisting with firefighting efforts. The Honourable Man for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, first of all, allow me, on behalf of the Bloc Québécois, uh, allow me to express our solidarity with the Quebecers evacuated by the forest fires and with all those who are worried. We are here with you. Our members of parliament are on the ground, and it is important to note that cooperation between governments is going well right now. Mr. Speaker, we are going to have to talk to each other clearly and honestly about climate change. But for the time being, let us contain the fires first and give full support to those affected. Will the government accept our outstretched hand and our cooperation? The Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, we are all concerned by the situation. From the very beginning, I'd like to thank firefighters for their work. I'd like to commend their courage. We received Quebec's request last Saturday. We answered yes, absolutely, in the following hours. We sent people, 150 personnel are now in Quebec. We'll continue to be there for Quebec, as Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, Radio-Canada revealed that David Johnson hired Navigator, which specializes in media crisis management. He has a right to hire whomever he wants. That's not the issue. What is bizarre, however, is that he didn't hire this crisis management firm while he was in crisis last week, following the tabling of his report saying no to a public inquiry. No, he hired it on day one of his mandate, Mr. Speaker. So the question arises, did Mr. Johnson know from the very beginning that he was going to oppose the public inquiry demanded by the public? The Honourable Minister for Interparliamentary Affairs. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows full well that the simple answer to this question is no. Mr. Johnson took the time to uh, look at all documents, had a number of interviews with those directly involved in these questions of foreign interference. Mr. Johnson reached an independent and serious conclusion, something that is a breath of fresh air in this House of Commons. Based on a recent survey, nearly half of homeowners and over half of renters in this country are struggling to make their monthly payments. Now, I know that the Prime Minister nor the Leader of the Opposition have ever had to worry about this, but it is scary. On top of that, the Bank of Canada is poised to very likely increase interest rates, which will make the situation even worse. When will the Prime Minister take this seriously and take steps to bring down the cost of rent? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. 
Speaker, our government absolutely understands the challenges that people are facing with the cost of living, particularly Canadians who rent. And that is why last fall we provided a top-up to people who needed support paying their rent. That is also why we are very glad that on the 5th of July we are going to be able to provide the grocery rebate targeted at 11 million vulnerable Canadians and Canadian families who need that support the most. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. This Liberal government needs to start acting like this is a crisis. Le Banque du Canada va The Bank of Canada will no doubt increase interest rates, which will make things even worse. It'll put even more pressure on workers. This government has done nothing to tackle the greed of large corporations that massively contribute to the increase in inflation. Is the government on the side of workers or the side of corporations? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is on the side of all Canadians in every region and every province. That is the reason for which we will help the most vulnerable on the 5th of July with a targeted and significant aid and assistance. And that is why for us, jobs and economic growth is the most important target. And we are so proud that 900,000 900, jobs have come back. That is a great result for Canadians. Thornhill. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, the Finance Minister has never found a tax that she didn't like, a pocket that she didn't want to pick, or a deficit that she didn't want to run. Thanks to her endless spending, we have a crisis. Canadians are paying more for groceries, more to fill up on gas, more to heat their home if they can afford one. Will she finally stop the reckless deficit, stick to a th single thing that she told Canadians, and tell us in which month of the year never will she balance the budget? <laughs> The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to recklessness, what is reckless is these Conservatives playing childish parliamentary games and stopping Canadians from getting the support they need. Let me list for the Canadians listening some of the things these Conservatives are blocking. They are blocking an improvement in registered education savings plans, a change that will make it easier for students to get the money their parents have saved up for to pay for their education. They are blocking a ban on cosmetic testing on animals, Mr. Speaker. They are blocking our efforts to cut the criminal rate. Well, member for Thornhill. The finance minister can continue to lecture Canadians, but that won't pay their bills. She can continue to pretend like everything's fine, but that doesn't change the fact that people are hurting. And they're hurting because of her inflationary deficits, the tax increases, the broken promises of her boss's failed economic track record. She said she would balance the budget. She said the debt ratio would go down. She said there would be no more out of control spending. She did didn't keep her word. She doesn't answer questions in this house. Why would anybody trust anything that she says? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would never lecture Canadians, but you know what? I will take no lessons from these Conservatives. This is the childish, irresponsible group of MPs who are today blocking the essential measures in our budget implementation legislation. They are blocking the clean tax credits we put forward, which are going to drive jobs and growth and climate action. They are blocking an extension of the seasonal EI program. I'd like to know what particularly their MPs from Atlantic Canada feel about that frivolous tactic by their... Honourable member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. The finance minister pretended to have an inflationary epiphany back in November. She admitted deficits lead to inflation finally. She said she didn't want to pour fuel on the fire of inflation. She promised no more deficits after 2027. It's the same deficits that gave Canadians the worst cost of living crisis in history. It only took her six months after that to do a massive flip-flop and admit in her failed budget, she'd never end her deficit spending and poured a $60 billion jerry can of fuel on the inflationary fire that she started. Will she stand up and admit she misled Canadians and end her inflationary deficit spending? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> 
Mr. Speaker, let me suggest one reason why the Conservatives are resorting to these reckless and desperate and childish parliamentary tactics. It's because they don't want Canadians to remember how badly they coped with the 2008 recession. In 2008, it took Canada 20, it took Canada 110 months for employment to recover. After the recession, the COVID recession, which was much deeper, it took just 24 months for employment to recover, here, here. Mr. Speaker. Honourable, Honourable Member for Calgary, Forest Lawn. Mr. Speaker, Conservatives will continue to block this Liberal NDP government from piling on an extra $4,200 of debt on the struggling backs of Canadians. And this Finance Minister's deficits are continuing to fuel inflation and drive up cost of everything and drive more Canadians into food banks than ever before. Her inflationary spend made housing more unaffordable, and rents and mortgages have doubled because of their failed policies. When will she finally show some responsibility and balance the budget so, so interest rates can come down and Canadians can finally afford to live and heat their homes? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada's GDP grew by 3.1 per cent in the first quarter of this year. That is the fastest growth in the G7. And you know what else, Mr. Speaker? We have recovered more than 900,000 jobs since the trough of COVID. Now, by contrast, Mr. Speaker, after 2008, the Conservatives failed failed to support Canadians and failed to help Canada recover from the 2008 recession. In fact, as David Dodge said, because it was obsessively focused on reducing the federal deficit, the Harper government unnecessarily <coughs> contributed to the Honourable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Stephen McNeil, former Liberal Premier of Nova Scotia, said if governments continue to spend beyond their means, they will continue to have inflation that continues to put pressure on household budgets. Uh, former Liberal Cabinet Minister John Manley said, uh, it's a bit like driving a car with one foot on the accelerator and the other on the brake. It's not a good plan for controlling the direction of the economy. The Prime Minister is not listening to the opposition parties or even his Liberal friends, but we are clear we must return to a balanced budget now. Will the Prime Minister act in the interests of our future generations? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I have a lot of respect for the member for Charlebourg Saint Charles. However, I have a bit of advice for him. Listen to Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Canadians told us three things: help us with the cost of food, and that's exactly what we're doing. Eleven million Canadians will benefit from our measure. Second of all, they said invest in healthcare because we want to have family physicians. The third thing they said is invest in the economy of the future to build tomorrow's economy. That is exactly what we are doing. And uh, the Honourable Member should listen to Canadians from time to time. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, I think that all we do is listen to Canadians because what they're telling us is that everything's more expensive and they have less money than before. This because of this government's inflationist policies. It's rather clear. That's what people are saying to us because we're actually listening to them. And even former Liberal Prime Ministers and Liberal Ministers are saying it. So with all due respect to my colleague, Mr. Speaker, can you tell us if they will stop their inflationist measures so that Canadians can finally have a bit more money in their pockets? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. I'm sure that the people of Charlebourg de Saint Charles watching us today are rather surprised. The government is proposing to help people. People need a helping hand right now. When Canadians need a helping hand, they know which side of the house is going to help them. And that's exactly the reason for which the Minister for Finance tabled a, uh, an assistance for food, a deduction for food that will help 11 million Canadians, including many people will no doubt be in Charlebourg de Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, we have to help Canadians when they need it, and that is exactly what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr. Speaker, it is impossible to get answers about Chinese interference. Take a look. When the Bloc asked how many elected officials in total have been the subject of threats and, uh, or disinformation, the government refuses to answer. When the Conservatives ask how many Chinese police stations remain in operation, the government refused to answer. When the NDP asked about the links between the staff of the Special Rapporteur 
and the Liberal Party, it refused to answer. And when the three parties all call for a public inquiry, the government again refuses. It's a denial of democracy, Mr. Speaker. So, where did they get their answers? Where do we get our answers if the government refuses to provide them and refuses to allow an inquiry? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I would like to reassure my colleague that the government is continuing to undertake all actions necessary on a subject that is very serious. This is fighting against foreign interference. But there's a new champion for David Johnson. That's the leader of the opposition, yes. He's David Johnson's newest champion. He said that this individual, Mr. Johnson, is a man with a huge amount of credibility. And so, despite the records between Mr. Johnson and the Conservatives, we'll continue to trust in him for the next steps on this important issue. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, that didn't answer my question at all, but the Liberal solution is ready-made. Faced with a Prime Minister who hides the truth from the public, they would like to force the, op the opposition leaders to join him in his secrecy. Everyone in secrecy, no one to inform the greater population. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have the problem backwards. The problem is not that the public knows that China is interfering in democracy. On the contrary, the problem is that China can continue its interference in the shadows. The problem is not the light, it's the shadow. When will there be a public and independent inquiry, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister for Interparliamentary Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I think that my friend from the Bloc is perhaps a little bit confused about what is keeping Canadians in the dark. The Conservatives did absolutely nothing on foreign interference, despite the fact that uh, intelligence officers raised this issue publicly in 2013. Our government, Mr. Speaker, did the opposite. We implemented measures to fight against foreign interference. We strengthened, we further strengthened measures every single time that we received advice from experts. And that is exactly what we will do with the recommendations from Mr. Johnston. The Honourable Member for Laurent de la Belle. Mr. Speaker, whilst the government is talking about opposition leaders, left, right and centre, it is not talking about Chinese interference. That is what we need to tackle. Under the Johnson report, there will be no inquiry into Chinese police stations. There will be no investigation into Chinese-backed election candidates. There won't be no investigation into intimidation of the Chinese diaspora. There won't be no investigation into threats against elected representatives. So what's the point of letting Mr. Johnson continue his work if he tells us himself that he will not investigate Chinese interference in democracy? The Honourable Minister. With all due respect to my colleague, Mr. Speaker, our government has a record of tangible action on the issue of foreign interference. With the creation of new powers for CSIS, with the creation of a new national coordinator to fight against foreign interference, and with public consultations for the creation of a new register for foreign agents. We are ready to work together with the Bloc and with all MPs in order to fight against foreign interference to better protect our democratic institutions here in Canada. Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, food costs are up. Inflation is up. up. Mortgage payments are up. Rental payments are up. Faith in this Prime Minister is down. When will this Prime Minister end his inflationary deficit, scrap the tax, and bring back the common sense of the common people? Mr. Speaker, I'm not actually sure there was a question no, in no, there. I don't think there was. I don't, I don't mind so. actually sharing with the Conservatives what we're doing. For their benefit. Yeah. I want to remind the Honourable Members, there's a little bit of chattering, and I'm not pointing on either side here, and just remind the Honourable Members that this chamber is much more technically advanced than our old chamber, and it picks up everything. So if someone's speaking and someone next to the microphone, or even not even next to the microphone, a couple of seats away says something, 
they'll pick them up. So I just want everyone to keep that into consideration while, they're, uh, while there's someone speaking. The Honourable Minister for Families, please uh, start over so we can hear the whole thing and it'll be nice and quiet then. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, I'm, I'm not actually sure my Honourable colleague asked a question there, but I don't mind enlightening him to uh, the measures that we have taken to help Canadians with the high cost of living. For example, Mr. Speaker, we brought forward the Canada Housing Benefit that helped millions of Canadians who are low-income renters. We brought forward the Canada Dental Benefit that has helped over 300,000 Canadian children access the dentist, and the Canada Child Benefit, which is now up to almost $7,000 a year per child under the age of six for the lowest-income Canadians, Mr. Speaker. And if I could also mention the grocery rebates, which will be going up to 11 million Canadians this July. Well, member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, Liberal deficits drive inflation and Canadians are paying the price. John Manley said that government fiscal policy is making it harder to contain inflation, and Stephen Polo said that government deficits last year made the Bank of Canada raise interest rates higher, which means Canadians are paying a higher price for this government spending. Just last, last month, inflation went higher when the, this Minister of Finance said Canadians should expect inflation to go lower. Is there a plan to end inflationary deficits and spending to bring down inflation and interest rates? The Honourable Minister for Families. I also don't mind providing a bit of a history lesson to Conservatives it. because, in fact, when the Liberals uh, left government in 2006, they left the Conservatives with a big health yep. surplus. Yep. But what did Conservatives do? Well, they actually yep. brought in years of deficits while problem. cutting oh, services, Mr. Speaker, and Whoa. going through a global recession. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, what did we do? We invested global. in Canadians. We've supported Canadians. And, in fact, we know that inflation is high. But when it comes to food inflation, a new report today actually announced that Canada is the second lowest in the world when it comes to food inflation. We know there's more to do. We know we need to support Canadians, but we're doing the right things. Thank you. Yeah. Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we are proud of a record that during a recession cut taxes for Canadians. That's right. But let's talk about energy and food costs, which are some of the biggest contributors to inflation, which is why it's puzzling why the government continues to increase taxes on both fuel and food and making it more expensive by continuing to increase the carbon tax. These carbon taxes are the central bank says are inflationary, and this government wants to impose a second carbon tax, which wow. will just make food and fuel more expensive because you have to ship the food to the table and farmers use fuel in their operations. When will the government realize that their policies are making inflation worse? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, uh, 2016 was the worst year for forest fires in Alberta, and already we're on the verge of surpassing this, and we're on June 4th. The, we've just seen the worst forest fires in the history of Nova Scotia, and we're only at June 4th. Quebec asked the federal government over the weekend, they said, we can't handle all of the forest fires we are seeing, and it's only the beginning of June, Mr. Speaker. And what's the response for the Conservative Party of Canada? Let's make pollution free again. Let's allow the largest polluter in Canada to pollute as much as they want. Let's stop using the most effective tool to fight climate change, carbon pricing. The Honourable Member for rosemont la petite patrie Mr. Speaker, the housing crisis is hurting people. People are paying ridiculous prices, or they have to move. The Liberals are not having enough social or affordable housing built, and they're not investing enough in existing housing. Yesterday, with the leader of the NDP, I visited an affordable housing project in NDG, which has had to condemn entire housing units because there's not enough resources for maintenance and renovation. It makes zero sense. When will the Liberals finally wake up and seriously invest in accessible housing for everybody? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. We agree with him that housing is currently difficult to find. And prices are going up. That is why we have our national housing strategy that invests not only in affordable housing, but also in the right to housing. We need to legislate to do something about market speculation. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Minton Griesbach. The raging wildfires in Alberta have left countless communities devastated. As families were allowed to return home, I joined some in the East Prairie Métis settlement to witness the destruction and mourn the loss of their homes, 
cultural heirlooms, and family memories. Despite being hit the hardest, First Nations and Métis settlements have only received lip service from both the provincial and federal governments. Will this government take its relationship with First Nations and Métis settlements seriously and provide immediate housing supports to those who've lost everything? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I would like to share with the member that last week the Prime Minister and several of us met with the Métis National Council, for example, and talked about working with the Métis National Council to, to actually Im implement a priority on emergency management. I also want to assure the member opposite that Indigenous Services Canada and the Government of Canada has been working closely with First Nations and Métis communities impacted by these fires and will continue to support them in every way possible. Honourable Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, June marks National Indigenous History Month. An opportunity to recognize and celebrate the contributions of First Nations, Inuit, Métis across Canada, as well as their cultural, their cultural languages and heritage. It's also an opportunity to reflect on historic wrongs and how they've impacted relationships with Indigenous people. And the ongoing work to advance reconciliation, the reality of Canada's colonial history, including the disposition of Indigenous people from their lands, continue to be felt to this day. Can the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations please update this House on the work Canada has been doing to advance reconciliation to address the Honourable Minister? Speaker, to thank my friend from the Northwest Territories for the question. Last year, we resolved a record number 56 specific claims for $3.5 billion in compensation. And this past April, uh, in addition, we reached a historical settlement with Treaty 8 First Nations, which will return just over 44,000 hectares of land to those communities. Uh, we're also addressing a number of past harms, namely the harms caused by the, the tragedy of residential schools and the destruction of language and culture with the Godfreyson settlement earlier in January for $2.8 billion. Um, while National History Month, National Indigenous History Month is the occasion to reflect on everything that's going uh, well in this country for Indigenous peoples, it's also a reminder that we... All member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. On July 1st, this Liberal government is introducing a second carbon tax, an additional money grab from the pockets of cash-strapped Canadian families. With people already struggling to put food on the table, keep the lights on and make rent, how can this government justify yet another hurdle for them to overcome? So Mr. Speaker, running historic deficits and raking up reckless debt may be desirable for this government, but for many Canadians it is not an option. Will this government do the right thing? and cancel their planned carbon tax increases. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to congratulate the member for Calgary Nose Hill for her comments earlier in this House where she actually talked about climate change, which her leader has never done and very few of the members of the Conservative Party has done. And she said, let's, she begged us to do smarter things like public transport. Well, Mr. Speaker, every time we propose public transport, they voted against it. Terrible. They said building more emissions free electricity plants. Right. That's exactly what we're trying to do, Mr. Speaker, with our clean electricity regulation, but the Conservative Party opposes it. Terrible. For Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite are not listening to the people that have put them there. Canadians are going to be hit for an average of $1,500 annually under carbon tax number one. Carbon tax number two, an additional $573. That's over $2,000 for an average family. This Liberal government needs to reduce interest rates and get inflation under control. And they can start today. So, Mr. Speaker, I will ask again, after getting such a lackluster answer the first time, will this government exercise some common sense and cancel their planned carbon taxes? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. I would like to remind my honourable colleague, Mr. Speaker, that in their 2021 platform, the Conservative Party of Canada was proposing to put in place carbon pricing, but it wasn't a plan for the environment. But at least they were talking about it, Mr. Speaker. It was a, it was a, it was a plan to encourage people to pollute more. That's not the, the pollute principle, but we're, we're getting there. But they even refused last week to let us table their own platform in this House, Mr. Speaker. They're so ashamed. Yet it's not the first time that they've told Canadians that they were going to put in place carbon pricing and then walk back on their right. promises. Right. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, 
Recently, the Minister of Finance said that in order to do something about inflation, we would need deficits. We would need to reduce deficits, rather. And then later, Liberal Party activists said that, no, we need deficits. For someone who's dreaming of becoming the leader of the party, that's not good news. But that's what the Liberal members said. And what's really bad news for all Canadians is that there's going to be a second carbon tax. Can the Minister of Finance confirm what the PBO said? That this is going to call for this is going to cost four hundred and thirty six dollars more per year on average per Quebec family, the Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind my honorable colleague that in his party's election platform during the last campaign, they proposed a clean fuel standard. The difference between them and us is that when they get into power, they do the opposite of what they promised. We do exactly what we promised. We are committed to fighting climate change, creating good jobs, and supporting the economy, and that's what we're doing. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, I have nothing against the Minister of the Environment, but I was asking my question to the person who dreams of becoming the leader of the Liberal Party, the Deputy, Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Why? Because this affects Canadians' wallets directly. The parliamentary budget officer said that this was going to cost, on average, $436 more per year on average. Does the aspiring prime minister want to tell Canadians whether this is true or not? The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party keeps harping on about deficits. But I would like to remind them that when the Liberal government left before the Harper government, there were surpluses in the budget, but they burned those surpluses away by cutting programs and cutting services. Each time the Conservative Party sees a problem, they just decide to cut, cut, and cut. We want to help Canadians, and we're, as we're asking the Conservatives to speed things up to pass the budget so it can benefit Canadians. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Mr. Speaker, $3 billion more for Trans Mountain. That's what Reuters revealed on Friday. Ottawa has co-signed two additional loans in March and May and discreetly published them last week on a website that no one goes on. Mr. Speaker, ch climate change is happening now, today. How much longer will the federal government be wasting billions of dollars to export dirty oil in the middle of a climate crisis? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as Canadians, we know that it is important to get a fair price for our resources on the markets. That's important for Canada, and it's important for all Canadians. We could even say that from the point of view of a sovereignist for Canada's economy, an economic sovereignist of Canada, that's a very important point. We do not intend to be the long-term owners of the project. The Honourable Member. All of these billions of dollars in loans co-signed by the federal government is registered in Canada in the Canada account. A and according to the criteria of that account, the risks will be assumed by the federal government. It's very clear, which means that ultimately, taxpayers are responsible for every cent invested in Trans Mountain. Who today would still have the gall to say that those billions of dollars are better used investing in Trans Mountain than in fighting natural disasters caused by climate change. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government does not intend to be the long-term owner of the pipeline. Our government understands the importance of Canada's economic sovereignty and for Canada to have control over its own exports and natural resources. But I do agree with my colleague regarding the climate. That's why Canada has invested $120 billion in our plan for the green industrial pivot. What St. James is Cinnaboya heading lead? Carbon tax one will add 41 cents a litre to the price of gas. Now carbon tax two will add another 17 cents on top of that. To make matters even worse, they're going to tax these taxes by adding the GSD. Mm -hmm. It all adds up to a whopping 61 cents a litre. These taxes will make everything more expensive while Canadians can 
barely make ends meet. It's time to take their foot off the gas. When will they axe the tax? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying earlier, Canadians are battling forest fires right across the country. It is likely going to be the worst year for forest fires in the history of Canada. And while this is happening, just last week in this House, the member for Red Deer Mountain View rose to, to tell Canadians that climate change is normal, Mr. Speaker. So it's not that they, it's not that they don't care about climate change. It's not that they don't want to even understand it. They don't believe it's a, it's a problem. So why have any plans to fight climate change? Why have any plans to help Canadians adapt to what is a changing climate as more and more Canadians will face the impacts of climate change? Full member for Calgary Confederation. Mr. Speaker, as Canadians plan their summer vacations, many are shocked with skyrocketing costs, the motel prices, the food prices, and in particular the gas prices. The Liberal carbon taxes will add a shocking 61 cents to a litre of gas. Oh, and don't forget the GST on top of that, Mr. Speaker. Not all Canadians get to jet off on vacation where taxpayers pay for the fuel. What is this Liberal government going to do to make sure Canadians can afford the gas to see their family, to see their friends, and to see their country? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Immigration. My time as a parliamentarian, I have had the honour and privilege of getting to know the honourable member, and I respect him deeply. Uh, but I have to say, Mr. Speaker, when we're dealing with the consequences of climate change we, at home, we know we need to reduce our pollution. We also know that the most cost-effective way to combat climate change is to put a price on pollution. With respect to this specific policy, eight out of ten Canadian families are going to receive more. What the Conservatives are advocating for, Mr. Speaker, is to take that money away from families so they can give it to polluters. This is nonsensical policy. We're going to continue to advance an ambitious environmental agenda and make life more affordable at the same time. The Honourable... Okay, we'll, uh, we'll skip over that one and maybe come back to it later. Go to the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After hours and hours of delay caused by the Conservatives, and thanks to the hard work of Liberal members, the Standing Committee on Finance completed its work on the Budget Implementation Act last week. Unfortunately, the Conservatives are continuing to delay this bill's progress here in the House. Can the Honourable Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance tell this House about how the measures in this bill will help Canadians? And why it's so important to get it passed quickly? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for this excellent question. After more than 28 hours of delay by the Conservatives, the Standing Committee finally sent the bill back to the House, Bill C-47. This bill would enable people to get benefits from the Canada Workers' Benefit more quickly. It would improve education savings plans and would reduce trades people's uh, SME's tax burden by reducing their credit card fees. I would ask the Conservatives to stop with their ridiculous games and get this bill adopted. Nia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, these tax and spend Liberals are at it again. It's not bad enough that Canadians are skipping meals and going to food banks because they can't afford to eat and heat with the punishing taxes that this government is going to triple, triple, triple. Now the Liberals want to double down with a clean fuel tax and put a tax on the tax. The combination of these will raise the price of gas 61 cents a litre, costing thousands of extra dollars to Canadians that can't afford it. Sad. When will the Liberals axe carbon tax 1.0, 2.0, and the tax on the tax. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Families. You know, Mr. Speaker, at a time when the country is literally on fire and tens of thousands of Canadians have had to flee yeah. their homes, right. it's incredulous that the Conservatives continue to denigrate efforts to fight 
That's climate right. change. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, it's hard to believe them if they say they take the environment seriously, but it's even harder to believe them when they talk about affordability, because every time we have put forward measures to support Canadians, Vote they have voted against them. But, Mr. Speaker, this July 5th, the grocery rebate will be going out to Canadians, $467 on average. Mr. Speaker, will continue to be there for Canadians. Thank here, here. you. Member for Sarnia Lambton. Speaker, let me give you some reality. There has been a carbon tax for years. It's done nothing to stop forest fires in this country, and it will never stop forest fires. It is a tax plan. It is not an environment plan. The only thing the carbon tax does is punish hardworking Canadians. So will the Liberals quit double doubling down on the triple, triple, triple carbon tax and axe the tax? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, this question's highlights how the Conservative Party of Canada has no understanding whatsoever of the science of climate change. As if you can flick a switch and the climate's going to be all right. It's this, you know, magical thinking that invest your money in cryptocurrencies and all's going to be good with the economy in Canada, Mr. Speaker. It's the same thing. So if the leader of the opposition won't take a briefing on Chinese interference, maybe he'll take a briefing on climate change. My department would be very happy to provide that to him and any member of the Conservative Party. Mr. Speaker, despite what the Liberals say, the carbon tax will have an impact in Quebec, just as farmers and truckers. And as if that weren't enough, this government wants to add another tax, a tax on a tax. In Quebec, that will represent $436 more per year, per family. Canadians are already struggling with inflation and interest rates that just keep going up. People are exhausted. Will this Prime Minister finally give him a break and axe his second tax? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, Quebec has had its carbon market for some time. So the federal pollution pricing system will not apply. We have several measures to support the agricultural sector, especially clean agricultural programs. I would invite farmers who want to access those new technologies to reduce their emissions and become more resilient. I would invite them to take advantage of that program. Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, on World Environment Day, we recognize our shared responsibility to protect our planet and fight climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution now and in the future. This year, the theme for World Environment Day is solutions for plastics pollution. This is an opportunity to highlight the initiatives taken by Canada such as banning of certain harmful single-use plastics to preserve the plentiness of our shores. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change tell us what solutions our government is putting forward to reduce plastic, solution, plastic pollution? Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. and I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question and his advocacy on this issue. Happy World Environment Day, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. I'm happy to announce that in just a few weeks, on June 20th, the single-use plastic ban will come into full force. Following that date, harmful plastics such as straws and plastic cutlery will no longer be able to be used, sold or imported into Canada. This is news worth celebrating. Plastic products that are harmful to our wildlife, our oceans, our lakes, and that is why we've, our government continues to take action towards zero plastic waste before 2040. 2040. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, despite the clear damages from abandoned vessels to food security, marine life, and the environment, the Liberals haven't done enough. Locals know this damage well, as abandoned vessels, or what locals call vessel graveyards, line our coasts. First Nations and community groups are willing to clean up this government's mess. All that's missing is the government's political will. So will the Liberals immediately provide the necessary funding to First Nations, locals, to clean up these harmful, destructive vessels? Here, here, here. here. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Speaker, the Prime Minister last year announced the renewal of the Oceans Protection Plan, which is the largest investment that Canada has ever made in protecting our oceans and our waterways. 
part of that plan is working collaboratively with coastal communities, with indigenous communities, to ensure that we maintain the health of our waterways, including, Mr. Speaker, collaboration on removal of abandoned vessels. We have, in dedicating the resources to work with indigenous communities to do so, we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, a few weeks ago, I asked the government about the drastic decrease in the budget of the Canada Summer Jobs Program, 30 percent compared to last year. And the Prime Minister answered that we had come back to the amount from before the pandemic. But when you look at the numbers, we can easily see that the budget is, actu is actually 60 million less than before the pandemic. This will have a major impact on community organizations, municipalities, the agricultural sector, SMEs, and of course, youth employment opportunities. So will the Prime Minister assure us that he will correct the situation in the next, bu in the next budget? The Honourable Minister. I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Youth come first and foremost in this country, and we have a suite of programs under the Youth Employment Skills Strategy, including Canada Summer Jobs. We have gone back, yes, Mr. Speaker, to pre-pandemic levels because employment for youth has gone down some 20 percent, Mr. Speaker. There are several, several programs within this suite, and I would be pleased to chat with the member more about them. Member for Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. While well, Canadians are struggling to choose between heating their homes and feeding their families, record numbers of Canadians going to food banks, nearly 1.5 million Canadians going to food banks in a single month. The response from this Liberal government is to increase their tax on everything. With carbon tax too, Canadians are going to be paying more than 61 cents a litre in tax on gas, which is going to raise the price of getting to doctor's appointments, but it's also going to raise the price of food production for our farmers who make our food. Why is this government continuing? Continuing to hammer Canadians with higher taxes. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives know that it's actually the contrary because since we've come into office, we have lowered taxes for middle class Canadians, we've increased benefits for low income Canadians, and in fact, we have lowered child poverty in half since we came into office in 2015, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't mean that we know there aren't Canadians who are struggling, which is why. Just on July 5th, we will be bringing forward the second grocery exactly. rebate that will be providing on average $467 for families of four in this country. It's also why we've brought forward affordable childcare. Mr. Speaker, if Conservatives truly cared about affordability, they have an easy thing. Support our... Afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. That's all the time we have for question period today. Il est as it is 310, pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23, 2022, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recording division on the motion of Mr. Beltold relating to the business of supply. Call in the member.